Now, the book of James is a practical book, and the question it asks and answers is, if you really believe the basic message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what kind of life will that create on the ground? What will it look like practically? And especially, each week, the background of the uh, text or the subject of each text has been, and what kind of community does, does that create amongst people who believe the gospel? This week, however, the text uh, puts the subject of community in the foreground. And therefore, what we have in this passage is chapter 4, and I've started with the last uh, verse of chapter 3. It's about the importance of community between believing Christians and then what the main barriers are to that real community and how to break through those barriers. Why it's important, what the main barriers are, why we really don't enjoy the community we're supposed to enjoy, and then how to break through those barriers. Nice simple outline. First, the importance. And the importance of community comes out here at the very beginning. It may not be completely, uh, uh, it, may, may not, it may not be the very first thing you, it, it strikes you, but look at verse 18. It says, Peacemakers who sow in peace harvest, raise a harvest of righteousness. Now, every word, the, the scholars talk about words having a lexical range. And the word righteousness, which is one of the main words in the Bible, most important words, means to be put right. You're right if you're righteous, you've been put right. And in some cases, some parts of the Bible, the, uh, the meaning of the word is this part of the range. It means being put right with God. To be a righteous person sometimes means put right with God, forgiven, justified in his sight. Other times, the word actually means it, it's that the, uh, the, the, <clears throat> the person using the word <clears throat> is using a meaning in a little different part of the lexical range, which means sometimes righteousness means having to do with our relationships with our neighbors and our friends. Uh, to be a righteous person means to live justly, to live um, with integrity uh, and uh, with love. And to be a, you know, a just person sometimes has to do, or a righteous person has to do with, with how we live with one another. When James uses the word, it almost always means both. James uses the full lexical range of the word. Uh, and uh, it means to be put right with God. It means to be put right with others. And therefore, it really means... All that the Holy Spirit is supposed to do in your life, putting every part of you right, your relationship with God, your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others. And that's why this is so significant, this verse 18. Because here James likens righteousness, the supernatural character change, to a crop. And what does a crop need? A crop needs seed. It doesn't grow without seed. And what is the seed for this supernaturally changed life? Peacemaking. And peacemaking here in context doesn't just mean making peace between two people. It means creating oneness, a a harmonious community. That's what the word means. And therefore, verse 18 actually says, you will never change, your life will not change. God and the Spirit will not put his changes into your life apart from deep involvement in a peaceable community, in a community of peace and harmony and oneness. Now, let's stop for a second and, and... talk about this because we have to. We live in one of the most individualistic societies in the world, and yet, although we believe, uh, this is deep in you and me, because we've grown up, if you've grown up in the West, if you've grown up in Western culture, not all you have, but if you have, then the, what you've been, it's been pounded into you that you are who you choose to be. You are who you determine yourself to be. You are who you... Uh, seek to be and and make an effort to be. You make yourself who you are. But most societies in the world, and almost all social scientists, even in our world here, and the Bible says that's not true, that that's a fiction, that you're basically the product of your family, your culture, and therefore you're basically the product of your primary community. So, for example... Social scientists will tell you, and well, we don't like to hear this, that your beliefs are much more a product of relationships than they are of rationality. That basically, you tend to believe 
or you find beliefs to be the most plausible if they are articulated by people you like and who like you (laughs) and who you admire and who admire you. And therefore, to a very great degree, it's your beliefs are the product of not your thinking and your reasoning, but your relationships. We don't want to believe that, but there's all sorts of proof. Social scientists will tell you. Secondly, I keep on pressing. When you, in, when you see these places in the Bible that uh, somebody does a terrible thing, terrible sin, sin X or Y or Z, very often the entire family is punished. And we modern Western people think that's a horrible thing. But common sense, social science, and actually most societies in the world say it is impossible for a person to grow up capable of doing X, Y, or Z unless the family, that family, to a great degree made that person capable, either by uh, more positively by showing them how or negatively by withholding from the person things that the person needed so they wouldn't commit X, Y, or Z. And therefore the family, the community, is the reason why this person is capable of doing X, Y, and Z. Social scientists will tell you, most cultures will tell you, the Bible will tell you, we don't want to believe it. But one of the things that starts to dawn, even on us modern Western people, that we are largely the product of relationships, we're a product of our communities, we're a product of our families and cultures, is those of us who, you know, you start, a lot of you are there, you start out in teenage years, especially when you're a teenager, you say, I'm never going to be like my father or my mother. I'm never going to be like them. I hate this about them. I'm going to be different. And when you're in your 20s, you still live in the, the illusion of that. And the older you get the more you see that you've been profoundly influenced than you are to an enormous degree like the persons that you said you'd never be like. Because that's just the way it is. That's the way human beings are. Let me give you one more example, just one last example. Uh, we just celebrated our uh, Redeemer, just, we, you know, our, this, the, the Christmas services we just had in December. They were our 21st Christmas services. I mean, we've We've been around as a church for 21 years, uh, not, you know, or at least we've had 21 Christmases. Our 21st anniversary will be this year. But uh, in all that time, I want you to know that I have really loved the fact that over the years, uh, we, the leaders at Redeemer, have seen p- p- thousands of people say, my life has been changed by this church. And very often they mean by coming to these services and hearing the music and listening to the testimonies and, uh, and listening to the teaching, oh, it's been so inspiring. I, my life has been changed. I want you to know that if you get to know people, you'll see some people say, my life has been changed by Redeemer, and their life hasn't been changed. They, they, they have all the same flaws. They haven't gotten any better. They have all the same besetting sins and temptations. Uh, they haven't really gotten any better, but they feel better. And a lot of people feel better by coming to Redeemer, but they're really not better. And there's a whole lot of other people that actually got better and have gotten better. And even though it's not a one-to-one on this, over the years I think this is the reason why. The Bible says, and I won't read you all the, t- I won't be to uh, read you all the texts. The Bible says we are to honor one another, accept one another, bear with one another, forgive one another, confess your sins to one another. You can't do that in here. I don't care how inspired you get in here. You can't do any of those things in here. Except maybe, you know, depends a little bit. (laughs) It depends on who you're sitting next to. But by and large, you can honor one another a little bit. But by and large, you can't confess your sins to one another. You can't forgive one another. It also says you are to encourage and challenge one another. Hebrews 3.13. Admonish and confront one another. Romans 15.14. Oh, listen to this warn one another, but we are to stop being fake with one another. That's actually a, a way to translate Romans 12, 9. Look that up. Stop being fake with one another. We are to bear the burdens of one another, share our possessions with one another, and submit to the needs of one another. You can't do that in here. And if this is the main way you experience Redeemer, you're not actually in a community. You're really in an aggregation. And as a result, by and large, you may get inspired and feel better, but not actually get better. Because it's in community that you get better. Real life is meeting. And you essentially become like your primary social community, the people you play with and eat with, the people you converse with and counsel with and open your heart to, embodied face-to-face 
regular community. That's who you primarily become like, and that's primarily uh, what forms you. And therefore, there is no supernatural character change without deep involvement in community. And not only that, up to now, I, I, give me two more minutes here. I've been telling you the importance of community, and I've been very pragmatic, very American. The reason why you need community is if you want to change, you've got to be in community. But actually, there's a non-pragmatic uh, uh, aspect to this. One of the most surprising things about verses 1 to 4, if you read it carefully, is you'll see in verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, what causes fightings and quarrelings among you? James is upset about the fights going on in the church. So there's two ways to fail to be part of a good Christian community. One is to not seek it, not just be indifferent, be too busy. The other is to get into it and then fight and fight and fight. Either way, you know, you are uh, not sustaining strong Christian community. But the fighting in verse 1, look what it says about it in verse 4. You adulterous people, we'll get back to that, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Well, what, what is it talking about? What is friendship with the world? It's the fighting. And what is hatred toward God then? It's the fighting. You know why? At least this must be part of it. In John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says, he's praying to his father, Father, may they, my disciples, be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete oneness that the world might know you sent me. May they be brought to complete oneness that the world might know you sent me. You know what Jesus is saying? The number one argument I'm giving you, the number one demonstration, the number one tool I'm giving you to show the world who I am is the beauty and depth of your love for each other. And if you fail to create and be part of a strong Christian community, either by indifference or by fighting, it's hating God. I don't know how else to read verses 1 to 4. That's what it is. It's trampling on the one thing that God has given you, the main things God's given you, to show the world who we are, he is. So there's both practical and principial reasons why community is so important, according to the Bible, number one. Number two now, so what is it that keeps us from experiencing community? What keeps community from, from really forming? And there are actually two causes here uh, that are listed in chapter four. One I'm going to call the cause of why we don't have good community. The other one I'm going to call the cause of the cause, okay? So one is a more direct cause, and one is a more the cause of the, the, the direct cause. And here's what I, here, here they are. The first cause we see in verse 3. What causes fights and quarrels? What causes the breakdown of community? Verse 3, uh, verse 1, verse 2. Pardon me, I'm wrong. Verse 2. You want something, but you don't get it. So you kill and covet and can't have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You want something. Now, that looks pretty simple. You want something. But the Greek word there for want is the word hedone, from which we get our word hedonism. And what it means here is you please yourselves. You live a life of self-pleasing. You want to please yourself. Your comfort, your convenience, your control is more important than anybody else's. Your needs are more important than the people around you. And that's all it takes. Now, I want you, please, would you please be patient with me? Because I'm about to tell you something that I know you're going to think is just a little too simple. And yet, I mean, that's, that's probably our problem. What I'm about to show you is so simple that you're going to say, okay, tell me something I don't know or tell me something important. But this is important. Essentially, <laughs> because you please yourself and I please myself, myself. Because I would rather put my comfort, my convenience, in a hundred little ways every single day ahead of the comfort and convenience of somebody else, of the people around me. That's the reason for this complete breakdown. That's the reason why we're not realizing community. Um, Thomas Howard is a Catholic writer who a number of years wrote a book called Splendor in the Ordinary. This is what I mean by saying he, he's absolutely right in saying it's in, it's in this... The, the, What's wrong with us at this point 
is wrong a hundred times a day. It's in ordinary life where we catch this or we lose this. And he, in his book, Splendor in the Ordinary, he makes a reference to George MacDonald, another 19th century uh, writer, who very famously at one point said this. George MacDonald said, The one principle of hell is I am my own. The one principle of hell is I am my own. And Tom Howard went on and tried to show that there's basically two ways to live. And the two ways to live, he calls the principle, you can live on the basis of my life for yours, or I am my own, my life for me. There's two ways to live. You have a hundred opportunities every day to either operate on the basis of my life for yours, see, your needs above mine, or my life for me, my needs above yours. And so Tom Howard goes and shows uh, uh, where this works or how this works. He says, for example, no child has ever received life except through the laying down of the mother's life in bearing and nourishing him. And somebody has to lay down his or her life to care for and train and provide for children year after year. We live only because someone else has lived by this principle, this laying down of the life. Now, he moves beyond that real quickly, but everybody, right, parents, you know that. The only reason, but listen, friends, the only reason you're here is your parents basically for about 18 years just kissed their lives goodbye. <laughs> kissed their convenience goodbye, kissed all kinds of stuff goodbye, kissed their money goodbye, that's for sure. <laughs> they laid down their life. See? They exchanged their life for yours. And then he goes on and says, This laying down of life always entails a death. It is death, in effect, to my 10 minutes when I give them over to help you get something done. It's death to your privilege if you let someone else in urgent need cut into line in front of you. The my life for yours principle is the only one on which any life at all is possible. To embrace it is to live, but to refuse it to live my life for me is to spiritually die and spread death. There it is, heaven or hell, lurking in your living room. You see what he's after? A hundred times a day, you see an irritating person coming toward you. On the basis of my life for me, you're sh short with the person or you just avoid the person. On the basis of my life for yours, you sit down and sympathetically pay attention. When you forgive, when you volunteer your precious time, when you're on a team and you just don't insist on your way, these are little deaths, and yet... They're deaths that lead to a resurrection. Death to your individual needs leads to a resurrection of community. Because, as Tom Howard goes on to point out, when somebody comes and dies to their 10 minutes, lays down their 10 minutes, lays down their privilege, lays down their time, lay, you know, goes through these little deaths to do something for you, you come back and you say thank you. And the minute you say thank you, community is created. You know why? Tom Howard goes on and says... Um, Thank you means I owe you and I acknowledge it gratefully. At least that's what it should mean. Thank you means I owe you and I acknowledge it grace gratefully. In heaven, such acknowledgments are forms of joy. In hell, no indebtedness is acknowledged at all. And you know why? Why they don't do that in hell? You see, the minute you say thank you, there's a bond there. Almost a little covenant. When you say, thank you, I, that, I really appreciated that, you're actually, you just lost some of your independence. You owe that person to some degree. You owe, you owe it to help that person. There's a, you've lost your independence, haven't you? There's, there's obligations of community now that are now around you in a bond. You've been bonded to that person in the smallest of way. But if a hundred times a day you put their needs ahead of yours and they say thank you, What's happening is joyfully, slowly, but surely, we're becoming a community. And this is, by the way, the reason why, remember in Les Mis, when Javert receives grace from Valjean? Valjean lays down his life because he risks his life and his whole future because he doesn't kill Javert, the policeman who's after him, when he had the opportunity. And when Javert realizes that he has received grace, he kills himself. Why does he kill himself? Because he knows that there's a bond now. There's a bond of community. 
It means he's lost his independence. And Javert, if there's anybody who lived by the principle of hell in literature, my life for my own is my own. You know, my life for me, it was him, and he would not give up that principle, so he had to kill himself. So he had to. Don't you see, in heaven, everybody loses their independence. Everybody is joyfully serving and saying thank you and getting happier and happier and happier. And in hell, everybody says, I don't ask for anything. Don't ask anything of me. That's the loneliest part of the universe. Now, do you not see that what the breakdown of community is made of is you want to please yourself. You want to please yourself. That's the principle of your life. Well, where does that principle come from? What's the cause of the cause? I mean, that's what, that's what community breakdown is made of. But what's the cause of the cause? And the cause of the cause, it's here all over, is pride. Hmm? Verse 6, God opposes the proud. Verse uh, seven, uh, 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. Why? The solution to the community breakdown is humility. Therefore, the reason for the community breakdown is pride. Now, um, Jonathan Edwards, who I often quote, uh, wrote a book that very few people have read. It's not one of his books that's very well known. It's called Thoughts on Revival, right there, you know, an interesting title. You know, the publisher should have helped him. But uh, the, uh, the reason he wrote the book was he saw two or three revivals. That, a revival is a time in which the church grows and people's lives are changed and the community is wonderful and the love of people for each other is wonderful. And every single time Jonathan Edwards saw in his little town of Northampton, Massachusetts, the, the revival was over because of fighting. Fighting brought out, bro, uh, broke out inside the church. Fights and quarrels and warfare and strife and controversy erupted, killed the revival two or three times. So he wrote a book and decided that the thing that kills community and that kills revival and that kills spiritual vitality more than anything else is spiritual pride. And in the middle of the book, he makes a list of uh, example. Uh, pardon me, he describes spiritual pride and therefore spiritual humility. And it's a terrific uh, description. And here's what he says is the killer of community, which is the killer of, you know, my life for yours. It destroys that. And here's, what, here's six things. Now, what I did was I paraphrased them because he, he wrote in the 18th century, so his language is a little too archaic. So I paraphrased it. Here are the six things that are marks of spiritual pride and therefore marks of spiritual humility. First of all, he says, spiritual pride makes you more aware of others' faults than you are of your own. But humility disposes you to be far more aware of your own faults than others. Therefore, number two, pride leads you, when you speak of others' faults, to have an air of contempt and disdain. But humility, a humble person, means that whenever you do speak of people's faults, you only ever do it with grief and mercy. Three, Pride leads you to quickly separate from people who you've criticized or who criticize you. That means you're cold to them or you avoid them. But spiritual humility means you stick with people even through difficult relationships. You don't give up on them. Four, I like this one, uh, a proud person is dogmatic about every, a proud person is dogmatic and sure about every point of belief. Proud people cannot distinguish between major and minor points of belief because everything the proud person believes is major. Uh, John Calvin had a friend uh, named William Farrell, and at one point he was very candid in his, one of his letters and said, Farrell uh, is always fighting with people because he can't stand to be contradicted. Number five, a proud person either loves to confront because you like winning or proud people refuse to confront because you really don't like uh, you know, you, you don't want the criticism and controversy. But a humble person confronts necessarily when it's necessary. If you overlove confronting or hate confronting, if you do it too much or never do it because you're afraid, you're not humble. Humble people confront necessarily. Proud people confront too much or too little. But here's my favorite. Number six, Edward says, a proud person is often unhappy and sorry for himself. Here's the reason why. Proud people are filled with self-pity because, A, they're so sure they know how life ought to go, and, B, they're sure they deserve a good life. 
But humble people say, oh, I deserve to be cast off, but only by God's grace am I living, and who, I don't know what's best for me. And as a result, he says, proud people are always filled with self-pity and unhappy with life, and humble people very seldom are and have no self-pity at all. So let's do a little inventory, okay? Humble people. Humble yourself before God. What does that mean? I'll tell you. Humble people are slow to speak of other people's faults. When they do, they always speak very gently and respectfully and kindly, never disdainfully and proudly. They stick with people through hard relationships and difficult relationships. They don't give up. They're very flexible rather than being dogmatic. They are not afraid of confronting, but they don't like it. And when they do it, they're very persuasive because they're not out to win, they're out to heal. And they have almost no self-pity. There's always quiet joy. They're never grumbling or complaining about life. How are you doing? On our little inventory. And do you see now that whereas arrogance, the form of pride that we call arrogance, certainly we see how that's a community killer, right? But do you now also see that the form of pride we call low self-esteem is a community killer? Yes, you heard me right. There's a kind of biblical pride, a kind of thing the Bible calls pride, that we call low self-esteem. Why? A person with low self-esteem is somebody who's always down on yourself. You're always feeling guilty or feeling bad or feeling like a failure or feeling shy or feeling self-conscious. And what does that mean? It's still my life for me. It's all about you. You're always concerned with how you're coming across or what's going on. Or you're, in other words, you're focused on yourself. You're thinking about yourself. You're feeling sorry for yourself all the time. And that kills community every bit as much. It's still my life for me. The arrogant person, or the, you know, the superiority complex and the inferiority complex are both self-absorption, self-centeredness, self-obsession. And they kill community. It's still my life for me, not my life for yours. All right, so how do we break through the barrier? Hmm? How do we humble ourselves? How do we develop this humility? And right away, we need to see something that I hope you've already begun to see. The way you and I today in this world call humility is not what the Bible calls humility. Because what you and I call humility is shyness and a lack of self-assertion, right? When you think of a a humble person, we think of somebody who's shy, maybe not very self-assertive. That's not what you see here at all. For example, take a look at uh, verses, uh, look at verse 6 and 7. God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble, so submit yourself to God. And then what's the very next thing? And resist the devil. Now, I know we live in a time in which most people don't believe in the devil, but I just want you to consider what, what James is saying. If you believe in the devil, and you know that this is a being of enormous power, this is the, the most powerful evil personal being there is, to say, be humble, and don't you dare be afraid of the devil, you know, take him on, face him down, okay? What James is actually saying is if he, if he says, I don't want you to be afraid of the devil, what he's really saying is I don't want you to be afraid of anything then. If you're not afraid of the devil, you wouldn't be afraid of anything if you believe in the devil. And that doesn't seem to go along now, does it, with being humble? Yes, it does. Moses, let me, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Let me put that into social historical context for you. Moses went in before the, the biggest, the most powerful leader in the world, the most powerful figure in the world, and said, I want you to give up your entire free labor force, which is the cornerstone of your economic and military superiority, right now, without, remunera- re- without remuneration, unconditionally, immediately. And then, the Old Testament says, and Moses was the humblest man on the face of the earth. You know what it's saying. You know the point. Moses was not courageous and bold in spite of being humble. Moses was courageous and bold because he was humble. Yeah, you know why? We have only been describing humility. We haven't defined it. Now let's define it. Here's what the Bible means by humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, I'm nothing. It's thinking of yourself less. It's looking at yourself less. It's not being focused on yourself because inside you are supremely confident of your own worth and that God is taking care of the circumstances of your life. 
Humility is not a lack of confidence. It's not thinking of yourself less. It's, it, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's focusing on yourself less. It's not looking at yourself all the time because on the inside you are supremely confident of your value to God and your worth and that God is taking care of the circumstances of your life. See, what is cowardice? Cowardice is looking at yourself, thinking about yourself. What is, ca- what is courage? It's forgetting about yourself. It's not even looking, not caring. Saying, I don't care. God's taking care of this. And you're courageous. See? Why is, uh, why, is, why is a humble person able to forgive and be gracious when someone attacks them? Because I don't care what you think of me. I know who I am. I know God's value of me. I know my worth. And therefore, if you vilify me and you take care of me, I can handle it. See, humility, kindness, graciousness, deference, forgiveness, courage, is a lack of self-concentration. Because on the inside, you know. It's not a lack of, of confidence it's incredible confidence. And because of, incre- see, a proud person who doesn't have that inner confidence is always feeling snubbed, is always feeling offended, is always feeling like I'm not getting my rights, is always feeling like what's going to happen to me now? That's pride. And that's the reason why proud people are not courageous. That's why proud people are not forgiving. It's why proud people are, uh, are always, uh, always having meltdowns, you know, over how people are treating them and humble people are kind, there's poise, there's patience, only confront when you have to and you do it very well, you're not always filled with self-pity. Are you starting to figure out what it means to be humble? It's to have this incredible inside confidence of your worth to God and that God is taking care of the circumstances of life. Now, how do you get that? I mean, that's what humility is, and that's what you have to have in order to have community. And so how do we get that? Well, the, the rest of chapter 4 gives us two things that you've got to have. Let me take what few couple minutes I've got left to show you what those two things are. They're, they're enormous things. They basically summarize almost everything else in the Bible, but let me show you what they are. First of all, there's, the two things are this. You can have this kind of growing humility to the degree you know these two things. The one is the enormity of God's love for you. And second is the upside-down principle that's at the heart of the universe. The enormity of God's love and the upside-down principle that's at the heart of the universe. Now, the enormity of God's love, only a second on this, but look at verse 4 where James says, you adulterous people. Well, that's a nice translation. The reason why the translators cannot give you a literal translation at this point is because it would be confusing. The, what he actually says here is, you adulteresses. Now, he's speaking to men and women. He's speaking to a church, male and female. But he very deliberately calls them all adulteresses. Not adulterers and adulteresses. Adulteresses. That's all. Why? Why would, he, why would he talk to an entire body of people, male and female, as female? And the answer is, James is tapping in to one of the great themes of the Bible. That God does not just love us the way a sh- shepherd loves his sheep. And God does not just love us the way even a father loves children. God loves us the way a husband loves a wife. God is our husband, spiritually speaking, and that when we sin, it's spiritual adultery. And that's what this cryptic verse 5 means. Without trying to untangle it completely, here's what verse 5 means when it talks about the spirit that God puts in us that is jealous and envies for us. When the word jealousy and envy is used for human beings, it's usually filled with a lot of negative stuff and cruelty and and that kind of thing, and pride. But with God, no, it never. When the Holy Spirit, when God envies and is jealous, it means he's longing for your love the way a husband who's in love with a woman, a wife, longs for her love. That's amazing how daring that is. He longs for our love, but that's not all. The second thing that we're told here. That's one little way in which James is locking in on the entire storyline of the Bible. But the other way is when he says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When he says, humble yourselves under the hand before the Lord and he will lift you up. 
This is the upside-down principle at the very heart of the universe. Over and over and over again, the Bible says this. The Bible says those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. The first will be last. The last will be first. He who would find his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. What's that mean? It means if you lay down your life for God, if you say, I'm going to follow him no matter what, I don't care what it costs me. If you lay down your life for other people a hundred times a day, if you lay down your life and you die to your own power and your own control, if you lay down your life for God and the people around you, you will get your life back forever safe and sound. But if you hold on to your power, if you hold on to your safety, if you say, I don't want to serve other people, I want them to serve me, my life for me, you'll become more and more like Satan and your life here will become more and more like hell and afterwards it will be hell. He who would lose his life will find it. He who would find his life will lose it. The way up is down. The way down is up. The way to have true power is to give your power away and serve. And the way to feel eternally great about yourself is to admit you're a hopeless, helpless sinner and repent and say, you you have every right to send me to hell, but because of Jesus Christ, accept me. And once you feel and sense and know and believe that he has, to the degree you understand that, that he's done that, that is the beginning of the humility that is incredible inner confidence of your worth to him and that he's caring for you in life. And it begins the, the be- beginning of this thing that enables you to have courage, enables you to forgive, enables you to, to lay down your life for other people, enables you and, and, and to have a kind of force field around you that creates community with the people around you. And when I say this is the heart of the universe, it's also at the heart of history. You know why? Think about this. The Trinity. It's before there was anything in the world. The Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were told what they were doing from all eternity. They were loving each other. They were serving each other. They were glorifying each other. What does it mean to glorify each other? Jesus says, the Father glorified me and I glorified him. That means you're deferring, you're loving, you're honoring each other. That was the inner life of the Trinity. And that's the reason why... God created a world in which my life for yours, the inner life of the Trinity, is the only basis on which life can be lived. Tom Howard wasn't kidding when he says, you know, basic life, even in this broken world, doesn't work unless people lie down their lives for you. You can't even, you can't be born, you can't come up unless somebody sacrifices enormously. And and of course, if the world had been perfect, and if we had followed God, of course, it would just be my life for years all over. But what is sin? Sin is, I am my own. I call the shots. I want to be first, not second. I want to be in power. I don't don't want to serve. I want other people to serve me. I don't want to serve God. I want to be in charge. I don't want to serve others. I want to be in charge. And that's where all the wars come from. It's where all the racism comes from. It's where all the injustice, where all the brokenness, all the family breakdowns, everything. That's sin. That's what it's all about. I am my own. But what has God done? In Jesus Christ, we see my life for yours in the ultimate. We see the humbling, the greatest act of humility. God comes to earth in the form of Jesus Christ. He leaves his glory behind. You know, in Romans 15, 1 Uh, Paul says, we should bear with one another and not please ourselves, for Christ did not please himself. And that's the greatest understatement in the Bible. Because here's what Jesus did. He came to earth, and he not only gave up his glory, but he gave up his power, and eventually he gave up his life for you. And he paid the penalty. Now, what was that penalty, class? You know what that penalty was? See, I, I know... At this point, if you're thoughtful at all, if you're, in, if you're listening to me at all, you're saying, guess what? I know you're right, but this my life for yours is awfully hard. I can't live like that. I know what James is asking for me, but I can't live like that. Okay, but guess what? Verse 6, he gives more grace. What does that mean? Jesus lived out verse 6, 7, and 8 for you. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus resisted the devil, in the, remember, in the, in the wilderness, and he fled from him. But when Jesus Christ, he lived out verse 6 for you in your place. He lived out verse 7 for you in your place. And in verse 8, when he sought to draw near to God, God did not draw near to him. When he tried to draw near to God in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
He sensed God's absence. And when he got on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What was the penalty that you and I deserve for saying, my life is my own? Cosmic loneliness. That's the penalty. It's the natural consequence. It's the fair consequence. On the cross, Jesus Christ got that loneliness. So that now, if you try to draw near to God imperfectly, you try to humble yourself imperfectly, you try to serve other people imperfectly, you try to resist the devil imperfectly, he'll draw near to you. Because he'll draw near to you because he died in your place. He laid down his life for you. And you know, the one place where to me this all comes together, the enormity of his love for you, the upside-down principle of the heart of the universe, it's in that John 17 passage I read before, but here's what Jesus actually said. He says, Father, I have finished the work you gave me to do. Now glorify me with the glory I had before the world began. May my disciples be brought to complete oneness to let the world know you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me, for you have loved me before the creation of the world. Even as you loved me. You see it all coming together there? Jesus Christ laid down the glory he had. He laid down his life. My life for yours. He proved that this is the way. This is the way we should all live. He humbled himself and then he was lifted up. And here's how. If you humble yourself, you'll know this. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, when you believe in Christ, in Christ, God loves you even as he loves Christ. Jesus says, you love them even as. For 30 years... That has been like a little explosion in my heart whenever I meditate on it. Would you like to do it? How much does the Father love the Son? What honor and glory does the Son deserve for all that he's done, for the cosmic loneliness he took upon himself? What does he deserve? How much does the Father love the Son? That's what you get when you believe in him. That's how God looks at you. Let that pound into your heart. Let that pound into your head. Until the confidence of your worth before God and your, the confidence that he is working out everything in life for your good starts to grow inside of you and then you have the real spiritual humility, that lack of self-consciousness, not having to focus on yourself. Then you can serve one another. You know, the, the, as I read in a book, this is the language of your heart. It should be, why should I be selfish when I'm full of real wealth and love? Why should I be defensive when all charges against me have been dismissed by the real judge? Why should I be offended when I have the love of the king of the universe? Why should I begrudge giving forgiveness when I'm awash in Christ's forgiveness now? Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let's pray. Our Father... We would love to have the kind of community that your son said would show the world who you are. It's not just for your namesake, it's also for our sake. But because of our pride and because of our lack of belief of the gospel, our lack of our understanding, we don't really understand how much you love us. We don't really understand this upside down principle at the heart of the universe. We are affected more by the world than we are by the gospel. But as the gospel becomes more reality to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, by this worship service, by, by our community with each other, we pray that you would make us more and more like your son who came not to be served but to serve and give his life. It's in his name we pray. Amen.